recording. All right. Good evening, everybody. My name is Buck Curtis, and I'm here with Eric Myers and Tim Rivera, and we are going to host our first Destreza Ask Us Anything. And the rules of the Ask Us Anything are they have to be at least vaguely Destreza related, and they have to be something that I would be comfortable answering in front of our kids. So with those limitations in place, um, let's go ahead and get started. It looks like the first one's coming in for Tim. What Godinho update? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> I don't know about a Godinho update. So, uh, I think there was a oh, some time ago, right? Um, and there was a recent comment on it uh, right. from from uh, Ryan's. Yeah. So that was there was a there was a small editing um, problem um, from one page to another where chapter started on one and ended on another and it got a little bit mangled so i retranslated it posted it on facebook on the common iberian sword play group and um, then wasn't happy with that translation after uh, ryan's lecture and went back and retranslated it because that that chapter i think 36 johnny said was just a mess it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. You could translate it a bunch of different ways because there's no punctuation and it just switches subjects around and doesn't know who's doing what. So, uh, as far as I know, there's no update in in the works. I mean, we, it's been talked about, you know, for correcting mistakes for another print run, but nothing solid. Okay, we've got a question here, which looks like it's going to go out to a wider audience. So, um, Lois, you're welcome to jump in on this. Um, what's the current state of uh, works under translation right now, and who's working on what? And um, just let, let's figure out our format a little bit. So, if you have a question and you want to just answer, ask it like verbally, um, like sort of raise your hand in the chat, and we'll call on you. Then you can unmute and ask. We've only got 18 people in the chat. It shouldn't be too bad. Yeah, it should be fine. Because um, I'm the first one in the, the list there. Um, both and a translation of Figueredo's Aplosophia. They're nowhere near releasing it. Oh. Yeah, so I am still working on uh, Pacheco's Grandeza. I'm on the second part. I'm close to getting the second part done, but I got distracted because I would get distracted. Um, one of the things that I'm trying to do with it is figure out what it is that he added in from uh, uh, what Carranza said in his book. So things that are Pacheco's invention rather than something that uh, Carranza mentions in his book. So I'm compiling a list of that and looking through Carranza's book. So that's making things take a lot longer than, than I wanted to. And uh, hopefully yeah. I can work with uh, Lois on that, who uh, is next in the list. <laughs> yeah, well, um, I'm, I'm currently trying to bolster my income by working on Compendio, um, which Unanimously, everybody said, "Don't you dare modernize this dialogue. We want we want as close to the original as possible." So, no modernization of the uh, of the text. Um, I'm of course also working with Eric on Figueredo, uh, and one of the things I've been doing with the uh, compendio text is comparing what I, you know out of Carranza, seeing what um, uh, Pacheco has left out. Tim, I'll, I'll gladly get you that information, which I think you may find of interest. Uh, Pacheco does cut out a lot of faff, but sometimes I'm like, mm -hmm, that, that faff was actually a bit informative. And I don't know if you got rid of it because you got frustrated or tired or you didn't think it was relevant or you're being a wee bit underhanded. Um, Pacheco wouldn't be underhanded, would he? <laughs> oh, never. Listen, the dude spiked his... At the very end of the prologue, you know, where he's explaining, this is how I've done my little 
you know, I've marked important passages with letters so that you can follow important themes through this work. And God willing, my second book will be out and will also include these letters. I'm like, dude, did you just did you just shill for your second book in the prologue of your dude? So. So we don't we haven't actually developed the marketing arm of Destreza is what you're saying, if we're going to yeah. do real true school. Um, as to Mary, um, she's working on some Carranza stuff, so she's been banging on some of the introductory sonnets, and she's been coordinating with Lois a little bit. And then I also have a project, although I wasn't asked. I also have a project that uh, you have to keep under wraps a little bit. Um, that's yeah, rude to tease. It's a tease. It's rude to tease. Yeah. Um, well, let's say that I have a deadline for next month for a draft on something. Is that right? No, uh, I have a deadline in October. Can we expect Mary to publish more of her Ednard translation? The goal on that is always yes. Um, unfortunately, like life, like if Jeff Goldblum says life finds a way, uh, like the story of our life is life finds a way to keep Mary from doing things like this. So we had three kids and then we had a kid with special needs and then everything was starting to line up and she was being able to get some work done again. And then like out of nowhere, this pandemic shows up. So um, school has started and the work that she was doing, uh, she's working like 15 hour days homeschooling three boys. It's crazy. When that, when that part is over, I think she's going to get back to it. We also have Matthew Howden in the chat saying that he's working a little bit on Tamarinus. All right, so I think that's sort of a collection of what everybody's working on. I know that Andre is working on uh, the Brea as well, and we have somebody who's translating Rada. If you haven't joined the Destreza Discord server, you should, because that's a place where we talk a lot about that. Maybe I can nudge Lois into putting that in the chat. Also, I recently came across a, uh, a phrase describing a different author, but um, seemed to very well to the Destreza authors and for any translator out there, I think you'll appreciate it. The term was irresponsibly verbose. And that is every Destreza author I have read yet. Was it Stephen Brust who said the soul of wit is brevity? <laughs> it was Stephen Brust who said this, that uh, we use the term responsible verbosity. Thank you, Lois. Um, okay, so we got some questions in uh, an email. So maybe I'll pick those up one by one and we can go through them a little bit. Well, hang on, Buck, before you start that, um, yeah. there, there was something that came up in the, the Discord, actually. Um, oh, yeah about translations and uh, and things like that that I, I wanted to touch on just a little bit. So um, because there, there are people who can make translations because they have the, the capability, but then there are other interested people who um, maybe don't have the ability to make those translations. So um, some, some of us, uh, me personally, I don't, uh, I tend to just kind of do a translation and I try and make it as close to the original without modernizing it as possible uh, so that people can come on after me who uh, maybe can't read the original, who want to work on it or work with it. So um, I leave that open to them to kind of develop a study guide or like an abridged version or, you know, something that's a little bit easier to study because some people have difficulty with uh, working with original text. So. Uh, Andrew Peterson, he's working on uh, one for Viepa, for instance, and he's been working on that and putting that out. So uh, if anybody else is making anything like that, you know, put that out there because I know a lot of people really enjoy it. A lot of people really like it. Um, but some of us, like I would love to do that, but I just I feel like my time is better spent trying to get things into English so that more people can can work on them. I think that's such a really good point too. I was talking with, I think Lois about this. And um, until we get the, like 
part of what we have to do with the Distreza is we have to build a community of people practicing the art, and then we pressure test everything. Uh, but until that information is out there, um, it's just locked away. And so, like bringing something into English and bringing it to the community so that more people can pressure test it and argue about how it works and figure this stuff out. That's the only way that we're going to get better. Uh, so bringing it in English is incredibly important. And English, um, I hate to say it, I mean, it sounds Anglo-centric and in some ways it is, but I've had people just flat out tell us that English is the lingua franca of Western martial arts. You bring something into English and it's, um, it's readily accessible to people all over the world at that point. Yeah, I've actually had people who uh, have been trying to translate Vietmai uh, into, I think, Russian, you know, from the English translation, which I don't advise, but, you know, they don't uh, have any other way and they're trying to get it to people who don't speak English. Uh, so that's kind of interesting, but at least it, you know, can kind of work as an intermediary and the translator is trying to take it from Russian or English to Russian or whatever the target language is. Can, speak with, you know, someone who's reads the original language or the, the translator or whatever and try and uh, try and figure it out. So we have a question in the chat. Um, we speak we we speak frequently of causes, but I've never heard a precise definition. Could you please clarify that? Gosh, see, this is one of those questions where I wish we had gotten that. Um, Andre, why don't you go ahead and take that time, take that uh, sujeta y libre uh, question, and I'm going to pull up Aristotle's causes. As I had promised to post a video of that in Distress and SUA, and I never did. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes. Sorry, I don't put the camera. I'm not presentable. <laughs> no, uh, because uh, I'm I'm taking it maybe because I talk about that in my presentation. Uh, causa sujeta. It's uh, when the well, you can correct me if, if if you don't find it that way. But causa sujeta, it's uh, sujeta means to hold, but it refers when there is contact of swords between the fighters. Uh, so you can do even a thrust, for example, uh, in causa sujeta, means that you are doing a thrust by holding it. And then there is the causa libre, that it's a bit vulgar because um, you, the swords don't, don't touch. And if someone plays a causa libre, uh, it's very difficult for the other one to try to do a causa sujeta. So that's where the other one, the diestro, has to try to find an atajo virtual. Uh, if someone wants to complement it, but I think that's it. I'm trying to multitask here because the only way I could think of to describe Aristotle's causes is to do it with a picture. And so I'm sort of frantically scribbling in paintbrush. Um, um, why doesn't somebody else pick this up for a second? I'm going to keep scribbling for a second and see if I can get a graphic for this. I, I do this as a lecture for BSIS because we're all like, causes, what the heck is this nonsense? And I actually take this lecture directly from that bacon that you originally pointed out. So when we're talking about Aristotelian causes, we're not talking about humane cause and effect. It's a little bit different. Causes are the whys of a thing, right? And Aristotle divides these flies into four general areas. There's your material cause, your formal cause, your effective cause, and your final cause. So if we talk about the causes of a cake, you know, the kind of thing that you eat, your material cause is eggs, sugar, butter, flour, water, the kinds of things that go into a cake. The formal cause of a cake is the shape. You usually see cakes in cylindrical shapes. They're often more than one layer. They usually have delicious goo in between the two layers. When we're 
about the efficient cause of a cake, well, what makes a cake a cake? Well, it's the baker who puts the ingredients together and it's the heat of the oven that chemically transforms these materials into cake. And the final cause of a cake is delicious. We love eating cake. Cake is tasty, so we're going to eat it. Yeah. So it, it kind of makes sense when you're talking about a physical object that, that it's that's comfortable. But then Carranza and authors after him apply four causes to fencing. And that's where it starts getting squiddy. Um, so if we think about it, well, great. OK, what, huh, what is the material cause of fencing? And there are apparently two schools of thought, which I didn't realize uh, until I read Tejedo. And I think Pacheco agrees with Tejedo. Figueredo has a different notion. And from a thought experiment side of things, I kind of like the way Figueredo but if we're thinking about fencing, what is the material cause of fencing? What is the material makeup of fencing? So some authors say it's the sword, right? You know, it is the thing that you're going to be actually using to uh, affect your final cause, which we'll get to in a moment. Um, Figueredo says that your material cause is not the sword, but it's distance. So just to hang on to that in your, the in your theoretical way, right? The formal cause of fencing for the aesthetics like us is uh, angle, line, curve. It's it's all the it's all the actions and approaches that make the stresso the stresso, right? Alex has an interesting point. I I'll try to remember to get to that. Um, the uh, the efficient cause is obviously the fencer. It is the person who is executing their will through form using the material of either or uh, the sword and distance. And the final cause is generally to wound your opponent or to prevent yourself from being wounded. I haven't read the actual materials recently enough to be confident about this, but I believe that they focus more on um, on wounding. At least Figueredo does in the little passage that I remember. Um, but from a general perspective, for us, the aesthetics is we're we're trying to we're trying to defend ourselves before we even think about offending somebody else. So that's that's the brief lecture I give on the forces relating it to a cake, and then bringing it back to fencing. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, the efficient, from, from Dhamma is the, uh, the efficient cause is the individual, the fencer. The instrumental, the material cause is the sword. Oh, no. The instrumental, I'm not that, that's not one of the four causes. I'm confused now. The material are the movements, so that's interesting. So now we have another point of view about material. It's not the sword. But the distance, it's the movements that you make, which I would wrap into formal. But that's just me. What do I know? Um, and the effect is the ex wound. The final cause is the effect is the execution of the wound or the defense where the completion ends. So it's interesting that he talks about instrumental cause. I haven't seen any bring up the an instrumental, which is which is your uh, a transition from the efficient cause to the final cause. Um, Mm. I'm not well read enough to say yay or nay on that, Eilish, but I, I totally buy it. So yeah, un unless folks have questions for me on that, I'm going to shut up and let others talk. So I have a, um, a graphic now. Let me just share it. So the thing is, um, about the way I like to present information, I've had to describe this stuff a lot of times, and I can never remember the causes, keep them straight in my head. But I have to explain, I have to dumb things down to sort of an oaky level, right? I, I'm from Oklahoma, and if I can come up with the simplest way to say something, like um, oppose with the true edge of the sword when encountering the adversary's blade, I'm going to say, turn your knuckle bow towards the bad guy's sword and give it a push, right? There's, there's an easier way to say it, and it's probably a little more fun if you do it with a redneck accent like mine. Uh, let me share my screen here. So causes for dummies. Now let me know if you can see this. 
all right, here's my little dude, right? And maybe that dude is my adversary. Maybe that dude is the sword fight as a whole. We've got these four causes that kind of feed into bubbles. And we know that Destreza is a school of applied scholasticism, right? It's Aristotle applied to real life situations in order to like affect this positive outcome. And how do we do that? We might look at somebody uh, like, let's say Eric, because Eric provides a nice example because he's so tall. Um, what are the material agents um, to Eric as a fight, right? As a, as a killer. Um, so I look at that and these are all the things about Eric that I could touch, right? Material objects. Like he's tall, he's taller than I am, so he has reach. Um, he has a sword in his hand. How big is the sword, right? Um, the ground that we're on, what does that look like? Um, Eric himself and the acts that he performs are the efficient cause. He's the one who's going to create that sword fight, right? Or I will also be creating it, so us two together act as architects or designers of this thing. I think Lois... Uh, describe the final cause really well. It's the purpose of the thing to to defend yourself and to wound while remaining defended. And then um, the form of it, like Destreza as a tradition, as a system of fighting, and the way that they think about technique, that's the formal cause. So if Eric comes on guard upright with his arm extended, I get some information about the formal cause. And I also um, know that he's probably using the Destreza system. If he hunkers down, and sticks that arm uh, out, but with a bent elbow, he might be looking at a, an Italian tradition. So then I know that the design of his fight, that formal cause is different. Uh, does this make any sense? I've lost my output, that's because I'm sharing my screen. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> there, there's something that, that I think about the cause. I think that it's interesting to look through it and understanding it philosophically, but um, it, it's not what I use when I'm, I don't use the language of it, like when fencing or when teaching. Uh, it's just foreign enough to to a lot of people. A lot of stuff we can, we can use like on the fly, um, but unless you're really steeped in the, the cause terminology, it's a little bit harder. Can help that, like we've we've seen um, here, that different authors actually describe different things as being the cause. So it's, it's an interesting conversation, but um, there really is a single right answer on it. Yeah, John, you had a question. You're muted, though. Yeah, um, I want to, I just want to throw this out there because um, I've been working on an essay. The premise of which is basically to kind of essentialize distress of thinking and how it applies not just to sword fighting, but also to living in a pandemic, for example. And uh, one of the concepts I've been kind of trying to do that with is the idea of causes. And my understanding of it or my simplification of it, my generalization of it is what I have basically osmosed from receiving instruction in class and tell me what your take on this interpretation of it is, but um, much less sophisticated than what Lois and everyone else is talking about. But I think of it in terms of being all of the things that make up the context in which we're fighting. So, you know, when we talk about defensive medio, for example, um, if everything is equal, if the swords are equal length and the fencers are equal height, then uh, that's that's an equal context, right? That's all of our causes are known. But if one fencer has a longer sword, now the causes are different. If one fencer is taller, now the causes are different. If one person has a shotgun, the causes are very different. And so it's just really looking at everything that makes up the context that we're fighting in. And also I think that kind of comes into the whole true vulgar thing too, because context is what that's all about, right? So, um, the subunits of context are what I think of as the causes. So what what do you guys think about that sort of take on it? Well, I think that's sort of what we we do in class, right? We we just roll up into causes, right? Um, to have a sense of the context, right? And so sometimes um, we could be talking about one cause, but we, we leave off the distinguishing terminology of material or formal 
uh, or fine. Yeah, I think. But, I think. But I, I think. I think you're, you're right, and look, you're looking at it right, right? It is what defines the context that we're. we're I think it also defines not just the context that's in front of us, but but actions, right? And and how we're interacting with that space. So um, you know, you may look at um, you know the a formal cause in the opponent, but we might also look at a formal cause in our own, right? Or a one, right? So there's and it's not like there's just true. one here, but they're breaking it down into all into context yeah that's absolutely right and that's kind of the gist of the of the essay is how do we take this distress of thinking and apply it to the world that we live in and the lives that we live when we're not you know fencing i think if you wanted to so i i agree with everything that's been said so far and i don't think we get a lot of immediate value out of codifying into the four causes and working that model although i'd be i'd be curious to try it sometime as a as a strategic exercise um, but yeah, just holistically looking at the causes and trying to use applied scholasticism as a method, I think that's really useful. So maybe if you're interested in that thinking, um, do some more, read, read up on applied scholasticism and see some of the other writing out there. Ah, gosh, just so very questions coming in. Yeah, just very briefly on the four causes. The reason I give that lecture and it's informal do it in pretty much every session that I end up teaching, is to help break students out of being very rigid, very dogmatic in the way that they're performing this FISA. By quickly going over the four causes, I can say, all right, so if you're fighting against me, I'm relatively short compared to many of the people in, in class. So you're going you're gonna to have to be differently, and that's okay. So your right angle might have to adjust to deal with my personal positioning and whatever I might be doing against you at the time. So that reason that we end up doing it pretty informally. It's just as a as a momentary dollop of information to get students to loosen up out dogmatic thinking and into more internalizing the principles of Vistissa and fencing with them and through them. I really like where you went with that, Lois. And if I can, I'm just going to follow that up with an anecdote. Um, so um, I had somebody ask me on the internet about teaching a student who uh, was a dwarf, right? How do, I, how do I teach somebody who is much, much smaller than their adversaries how to place in a Tahoe? And I said, don't, right? A Tahoe is based on a series of causes, right? So if you get different inputs, you need different outputs. And if, a, and if trying to put your sword over the adversary's blade is not physically possible, why would you strive to do that? Instead, um, because we practice the cause-based fencing, we're going to try to look at what that person's inputs are, the causes that drive that person as an individual, and then we're going to try and find a fight that will work best for that person. Um, so I think that's part of it, right? Never, um, like what Lois is saying about being flexible, those input causes, they should drive everything that we do. And, and at the point we find something to be false, we need to be able to set everything aside and look at a new way. I'd like to uh, to also just mention you had in the comments there has a has a, a sort of the, the PowerPoint on this right um, so you can look at the causes as as a, a way for what is the intolerable condition what outcome do I want to achieve what tools can I apply to the problem and what does the application look like or what is its shape and you know I think if we were steeped in the the, the language like this would be really useful, right? We would we would use language to describe the context and a short series of observations. Could, uh, the question could be the same, but the answer would be different, like for every. Um, I, I think that's that's good. We should we should probably we've got so many questions. I've got stashed yeah, let's move on a document, uh, but I'm going to take a pass at trying to write up an explanation of the causes in sort of a plain English in a in a practical distress or use use way. Uh, we'll see if I succeed at that. Um, okay, here's a question from email. Um, we know distress was pra practiced historically in the Americas and thanks to Rara, we know about a gap between the Verdadera Destreza and something called Destreza Indiana. 
what do we know about how Destreza was actively taught and practiced historically on this side of the Atlantic? I'm going to assume that that's the Americas. Who were its teachers and who examined those teachers? I'm going to pass that one on to Eric. Um, I really don't know that much about. I don't think we have a whole lot of, um, you know, a little bit about what uh, some, uh, there's like four pages written by someone who is the son of a student of Carranza in theory. Um, but, you know, we don't, we don't really know that much about it. We have a, we have an example write-up of someone who came from Manila to test in, <clears throat> I think it was Mexico City, um, to and presumably then went back to uh, to the Philippines there. I think that was in the 1700s. Yeah, we know Pacheco died in the New World, and we know that examinations were taking place out there. Um, but as far as the specific history of that, I think probably, I'm not sure that we're the right crowd for that. Probably uh, Manuel Valle would be a good person to talk to about that, or Steve Hicks. Um, Tim, uh, Lois, you guys have anything else to add on that one? And I'm trying to find the right document to help me out here. So there is, um, there's a book by Rada where, as far as I understand, so there's there was a book that was published out in like Lima, Peru, that has to do with a document, either a letter or a document that was published by by the by the by the head of the guard in Mexico City. And ended the heck out of Roddy, who's like, this is ridiculous, this is not this this uh this is vomit. And so this other dude comes in and defends, I think the Mexican guy's I can't remember. I'm trying to find all this information. It, it'll have to be the kind of thing that I'll throw it out later once I've collected everything. Um, anyway, so this, the, there's a book that has the Stresa Indiana, I think, in the title, and it's this refutation by this friend of the Mexican cap. It's like, actually, no, hang on. And then Raza has a response to that, and it's wonderful because he, like, the, the title is just, we, Cast salt into salt, Peter. You know, he says, uh, you know, refuting uh, the 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 assertions made by name of person, uh, graduate of the University of Deception. Like, it, it, you know, he's he's got opinions, and I think if I remember correct, in that book, it's a bunch of collected correspondence, and it may have lots of really good information, but until I clone myself, it is very low on my list. Um, I will do my best to find those books and uh, get links to those books either on Google Books or the relevant national libraries. But I do remember sort of reading that. So we may actually have more information than we think, but it's very book that's considered a secondary source in terms of the stress of that we we, ju we just there there are higher priorities in terms of what we're reviewing reading through. Um, my personal opinion, um, just looking at the looking at the weapons of the new world, looking at what um, specs are using in in the Americas, I really feel like they were probably doing something closer to Godinho. Have you ever seen Elbow? Like that screams hand protected Godinho. Um, so my personal view is that it's 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 very flavored um, toward uh, the vulgar style. Um, but at this point, we're in total speculation land. It's informed speculation, but for me to sit down and actually get you the sources behind why I'm, I think what I think takes much longer than I have here to just sort of talk about. So I had hoped that, that the Threat Indiana actually was different than the Threat, and I remember reading yeah, years ago, it's probably a decade ago. Um, Rada's uh, response is his uh, trashing of the distress of Indiana, and it was, from what I remember, it was more tedious than the 
the Pachakis, the currencies, the fight, it was the, the Destreza Indiana was just Destreza, but, you know, some guy did something stupid like define the formal cause differently than I did, so therefore he's completely wrong and, you know, is graduated from the University of Deception and all that ridiculous garbage that uh, they like to do with each other. So I haven't read it in a really long time. I was skimming through it hoping that there was some, some vulgar material because this is when I was still combing through books looking for or anything vulgar in there, and it uh, it really wasn't. It was uh, it was just some guys who did things slightly differently than Rada did, and Rada did not enjoy that. So, unfortunately, I hopefully I'm wrong. You know, maybe maybe I skimmed through something or or didn't understand something properly, but that's my recollection. And I've got the names because somebody was curious. Uh, Noah Valle wrote an article for. Uh, some kind of publication, and he like briefly has a chapter uh, where he he talks about this. So this is when Rara was in Mexico City, and the um, he uh, apparently mentions in Noblesa de la Espada the, his big work, the Indian Destreza, and um, so Rodrigo de Guzman uh, wrote uh, Carta Polejita. So it's, the his apology that was written right around the beginning of the 18th century, and uh, that's the uh, the guy that um, Rada goes back and forth with. Um, but then there's another there's another one that was attributed by Guzman to uh, Santos de la Paz, who I don't know who that guy is, but uh, apparently they argue back and forth. I I, I, died. I do I know who Santos de la Paz is because I've got the book in front of me. Ilustración oh, cool. de la Destreza Indígena. So I'll I'll make sure we we get a link to that book. I'll I'll try to stick a link in the uh, in the chat. But anyway, carry on. Uh, no, that was it. Just it kept going until Rara died in 1713. I have not been watching the chat, and now lots more questions are coming in. Okay, uh, and I still have, we've got lots more questions we haven't touched on yet. Interesting, another interesting question that came in, um, Buck, and that was, uh, what are the main factors causing the decline of Destreza as a major cool source? Like, I know you looked into this a little bit. I did. Can so, about that again? Yeah, so keep in mind that this is speculation. So I, this is more of an invite to conversation because I'm, I'm an engineer and a fencer, not a historian, um, but uh, sometimes I play one on WebEx meetings. Um, but if you think about the, the height of Destreza in the 1600s uh, up to early 1700s, what you've got is the Habsburg dynasty uh, and the Spanish empire in power. So they're this, uh, this empire on which the sun never sets. And then the last Habsburg, Habsburg king dies. They need to find an heir to the throne and they bring in a French Dauphin, a young person, uh, into the court. That triggers off a war of succession in Spain. Now you think about, uh, let me see if I can hold my hands up. You think you got Spain here and France here, right, next to each other. And then over here is this tiny little island, uh, uh, Great Britain, right? And suddenly you've got one royal family in control of that entire empire. Uh, and France. Uh, so Britain sees that as an existential threat. Um, so they immediately move in uh, and start uh, a war of, about that. So that, I think that goes on for about 20 years. And um, like finally, I think it's Philippe settles down. His rent is secure, but he's also young and French. So um, is it possible at that point that we start to see the decline of Destreza beginning and a French influence coming in? Uh, the next really big event happens. Um, we see uh, Napoleon invades France and uh, sets his brother up on the throne. Sorry, not France. He invades Spain and sets his brother up as the king of Spain. Uh, and that's significant um, because um, the fighting is intense and ugly. Um, and then right after that, we have, not right after that, but we've got War of Succession, we've got Napoleon 
Scots invasion. And then to sort of cap off the, the late 1800s, early 1900s, we've got um, the first great war and the entire generation of fencers was wiped out. So I think we're seeing a decline post 1700 and it's sort of limping along. Uh, it starts to move into classical weapons uh, in the 1800s. And then by the time we get to the great war, um, all uh, a generation of brilliant classical fencers were all wiped out and um, fencing never really was the same. Does anybody else have anything to add to that? That was what I was getting out of that. That's how I see it too. Like I see the the in, the outlines coming in, and uh, you know we just like the martial aspects of fencing, but it's also such a, a fashion influenced by fashion but you know, in a court if you've got a thing from somewhere else and they like something else then everyone goes and becomes interested in that There's a lot yeah, of, we might be of able additional to, influence we might Isn't be able to draw a parallel with figueredo right because figueredo writes it as Treza book and then portugal declares its independence um mm -hmm. yeah that's, that's exactly right yeah yeah so, yeah. so think, he's like he's, go ahead during the during the the war of um, restoration of the Portuguese, and um, you know he he had you know the permission and everything, and he had the whole thing written, but he he could just very well have decided that it, it wasn't a good time to be so explicitly supportive of a Spanish art. So we've got a comment in the chat saying that um, the first approximation hypothesis is the introduction of French culture. And that, that's always been my first explanation too, but we see um, Distreza continuing in uh, texts through the late 1800s, um, but it starts to become, uh, there. there's some French hybridization in some of it, and uh, it starts to move away from like rapiers into foil and saber. Uh, okay, another question. Is Destreza a civilian-only style of swordplay used for duels, urban self-defense, and for training at the Sol, or can a case be made for being taught as well among active military for use in warfare? Although for the fact that swords were clearly by now a sidearm uh, in the standard warfare of the time, I think Tim's a good person to answer that one because he's got some specific Godinho stuff that I think addresses that. Uh, well, unfortunately, I don't have much of a, an answer for that because of that uh, because of that caveat. You know that uh, I think we tend to romanticize the role of the sword in the military. I mean, it is it is a sidearm and it's it's a backup. You know, it's it's like uh, I mean, it's like studying how to fight with a pistol and then asking you know how they used it in combat modern days. You know, they don't they use a rifle. So the pistol is when things went completely wrong so this this often comes up a lot in um, amongst people who study filipino martial arts and try to find connections between that and spanish fencing and so there's a lot of looking at uh, the spanish military and how they uh, how they were present in in the island and how they operated and they employed a lot of native soldiers but uh, the the idea is that you know military training with swords is very very basic you know, and beyond that, anything that gets more complicated than that, the context of that is a duel. You know, if some, you have a sword, somebody else has a sword, and you guys are going to fight each other, you know, there's going to be feints involved and things like that. So uh, regarding using the sword in a, a military context, I think it's it's way beyond uh, a secondary comparison. And, and uh, outside of a formal kind of duel, I don't think that there's really much uh, much use for it. I know that Carranza and Pacheco were both 
involved uh, in the military. So we, we know Pacheco, um, Bronzo was a soldier because uh, he was Captain General of the Cavalry. But I don't, um, yeah, I don't know that there's a whole lot of detail on like military strategy or tactics or or just technique at a military level. The the one thing I was thinking of was um, I think it's is it Godinho who talks about cutting under shields, like getting people to lift their shields up and down again. But that's Montante stuff. Um, Eric, did you have anything to add to that? Yeah, a, a little bit. So you know, we 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 see a lot. A lot of stored instruction through history is based on single combat. So we know it was definitely used one on one. And the assumption there, and sometimes explicit, is that this is the basis of it. Um, and, you know, obviously, mass combat is a little different, but understanding how we're going to carry over. Um, the, you know, the famous Italian saber that's for officers to duel with, right? I mean, we, we have classical Italian manuals also, and they look a lot like cavalry manuals, right? They're, they're not, they're not, they don't look as much like, um, you know, Rod Alley or, or some of these other really famous, uh, texts. So I think that with the Destreza material, we're looking at something relatively similar. And we we have plenty of people who were in the military who still, you know, wrote about it. Figured in the military, he was a field marshal, he was a general. And, uh, you know, he had some, some well described actions. There was one where he was um, on the walls of Sun City and the, the, I don't remember what, officer was, but a uh, ranking officer came up over the wall and they fought together and he ran them through using destroys at the wall. So, you know, this, what Figueredo said was that against multiple opponents, there's no destreza. That's because you can't know all the causes. You can't as well, right? So he's not thinking about it as, as technique. He's going to change his technique for whatever is needed. But for him, once you mass combat, like that's not destroys it anymore. That's a totally different look at, than what we tend to think of here. We have a lot of people who who think, well, if you if you're not using right angle, you're not using destroys it. Well, you know, maybe maybe not. Like there's different different looks, different ways to look at that. Uh, so. I think where I'm going with this is this. Is Destreza useful as a military art? Probably, but probably not the way you do it in class. So didn't you just uh, spend some time not too long ago talking about how the Montante is a Destreza form? Yeah. <laughs> just say it. No, yeah, it fits into it's into Destreza, but uh, yeah, when you're against multiple opponents, you're using the same stuff that you use in your Destreza, but technically, the author would not consider that Destreza. But it's not because of the weapon, right? Because of the context. So we have a question from Ernesto. He wants to know if there's any author that we know of specifically that does not have a military background in Destreza. It's a harder question to answer, I think. Um. I don't know about um, Ettenhard. I know Ettenhard was a uh, master of the pages, right? Which was like a glorified sword fighting math teacher. Um, but I don't know if that meant that he was uh, uh, that he did not have military rank as far as serving in conflict. But we have uh, Matthew saying he doesn't think Thibault had any military rank. No? All right. 
Maybe Ed and Hart did. Last question from the person who mailed. Uh, did you have something to add, Ted? Uh, yeah, just just a little bit. I mean, it's it's slightly off the topic of Discovery, but um, so the uh, one of the early ones that I can think of is uh, Sandidier. So he's French, but you know, Southern French. So it's close enough to Spain. Uh, and he uh, mentions in his prologue that you know he's fought a bunch of wars and he's developed this sword system while doing that and. Uh, that's the one that is uh, famously kind of uh, ignored, you know, kind of looked looked askance at by most HEMA practitioners as being too simple, you know, and a little bit too repetitive because really there's only a few things. He breaks it down into like, uh, you know, a dozen different things. Here's how you draw your sword and, and you know, stab on this particular way or maybe cut here and that's it. And uh, so he's, explicitly saying he developed this, you know, found this to be the most useful in the military, and it's something that's very, very simple. So I think, um, you know, kind of going to what Eric said, that when you're dealing with multiple people and it's not a, it's not a dueling situation, like between officers or whatever, uh, you kind of have to keep it simple because you can't know all the causes and you just kind of have to stay safe and, and keep it that way. So. Um, I don't necessarily want to say, I don't want to give the impression, like I said earlier, that uh, uh, Defesa or any any of these sword arts were not useful militarily. Uh, certainly, if you knew them, you're going to have a better um, better chance of coming out on top if you have to use your sword. Uh, but the uh, context that everything is written in is written as a duel, you know, except for a few things in Gobinho where he's talking about being outnumbered or mismatched weapons and things like that. But usually it gives the implication that that's, you know, on the street and you're ambushed at night or, or whatever. But uh, he does talk about, you know, how to enter into a room with a montante to kill everybody in the room. And we do have accounts from Mexico that uh, I think one was during the Noche Triste where they ended up uh, being besieged within the city that they were technically in control of. And uh, there was a guy with a montante that can't remember if he made it or not, but he was trying to get back to where everybody else was gathered up. And there was a lot of close quarter fighting in the streets of Tenochtitlan. And so uh, those kind of things were uh, useful depending on the situation, you know, but out in like mass combat where you're ranked up in the, uh, in, the in an open field, like you don't you don't want to try and pull your sword out and use that at that point, you know. Because uh, again, back to the romantic notion, and this is more a literal romantic notion, was back during the Renaissance when they started bringing back the rodeleros, the uh, sword and shield guys. You know that that's kind of famous. You know, Spain is famous for that, and and Italy had theirs, but it was it was a very brief amount of time. It didn't last very long at all. Because it didn't work, you know. It was it was a romantic notion where they were thinking back to the old like Greek and, and Roman armies, and they wanted to bring that back. And uh, it did well in one battle. I can't remember which one because I don't know much about the Italian Wars. Maybe Ravenna, or maybe Ravenna was the one where it went horribly wrong. But it went well because the uh, the ground was kind of broken and uneven, and they were able to get in with their shields and their swords and cause havoc. But on the even ground against the Pike Square, they just were slaughtered. So um, when you're talking about things being applicable militarily, there's it really you got to look at more context than that because it could be, you know, street fighting where you're actually inside of a city or there's a siege happening and you're trying to, uh, you know, break a siege or maybe it's on a boat, you know, like you're on a galley, you're fighting on a galley, then swords are going to be much easier. You're not going to, you know, have your pike on a galley and start trying to stab people at the, uh, the other galley. Although maybe you did. I don't know. I didn't study galley combat. But there's a lot of different contexts for, um, for how people fought militarily. And so I don't think necessarily that the Tree Destreza was one way or another, you know, that it was only for civilians or only for military. I just want to add to something that Tim was saying, and I think this is, I think we'll probably find like more practical military advice in um, common school or old school. If you look, 
So the context I think that Tim's talking about is European military combat. But when you look at the story of uh, Bernal Diaz in conquest of New Spain, where they're an invading force colonizing indigenous people, um, like re uh, getting fresh stores of gunpowder into that space, that, that's a limited resource. And we have stories of them. I think we have sword and buckler stories from Bernal Diaz, which um, they, they, they used a lot of swords in those conflicts. And um, one of the stories I seem to remember, and I'm just going by memory here, but they had a particular kind of padded cloth armor and uh, they would come out of these fights and they would be pulling arrows out of the armor. It was just really effective at stopping um, the native arrows. So if you're interested in that, probably take a look at the Conquest of New Spain by Bernal Diaz. All right, we, we still have a lot of questions that we haven't touched. I think what this tells me is that we, we got some requests for an Ask Me, any, ask me Anything, and uh, there's a lot of pent up demand to ask questions like this, so we probably need to do more. Um, okay, um, pitch this one out to our gallery of speakers here. Uh, what is it that is special about Destrezza that sets it apart from other contemporary schools of sword play? Um, any worthwhile lesson, it can teach a modern practitioner better than other styles of fencing, whether that's modern, classical, or historical. Yeah, I have examples that I've, I've used. So I, <clears throat> I think that the you know, Destreza schools broke down time and move is really helpful. Um, the Italians have, um, you know, sort of like a description of a, of a tempo as an opportune moment to strike is they step, for example, right? Um, but they're still using uh, offensive movement is a, like a full circle is one movement. The, the Spanish into smaller uh, units. And so bringing that the other system helps a lot. And so if you really want to work in then Destreza theory teaches you more about how to do that language for doing that in. Uh, some of the the full or, or rules aren't aren't so awesome about it, right? So like there's things that that a a saber can do that a rapier just can't really do very well. Uh, saber is so fast in a full circle um, that that you can do things safely in that time given the distance you have to work in. So when I fence an Italian heavy saber, I have a very strong Destreza influence, and it, and it makes my game much safer for me. It lets me better determine what I can do, how I can assess um, what I can do versus what my opponent can do. On the other hand, when I'm into, I totally miss the term counterattack. <laughs> uh, Tim, what about you? Um, I'd agree with Eric. That's that's really because I was racking my brain trying to trying to find something because my uh, my initial reaction is nothing. It's not special, <laughs> but uh, it it really is uh, it really is the the descriptive framework that they that they came up with. So um, as with regard to what physically Destrez is doing, it's not. There's nothing special to it. I mean, that's that gets recognized later on when, uh, you know, like Ed and Hart or Rod are talking about the the uh, Italians and how they do things and saying that they, the, it's good distressa. You know, the um, the descriptive aspect of it is what really makes it uh, important. It has this kind of universal theory of how to describe something, and then it uses that a lot. Um, I, th I think it did have a potential. And this is this is personal. I think it did have a potential to uh, have be more than that, and uh, that's what Carranza was getting at. And I think uh, Pacheco kind of shoehorned it, shoved it down a road where it was a lot more um, prescriptive. Where it's like this is this is what you do because this is uh, this is what it is. Whereas Carranza was a little bit more 
wide open and more philosophical about well, how do you how do you figure out whether something is right or wrong and what makes something right or wrong and these are the principles behind it and uh, what does Pacheco said well here's how to describe it and then you know here's why these vulgar characters are wrong and here's how you defeat all of them with this this very descriptive language which ended up being the uh, the best part of uh, of what he made out of this character. Yeah, I'd agree with both of those ideas uh, from you and Eric. Um, so I think if you if you compare Destreza to other fencing, um, like one of the ways it sets itself apart is it's intentionally designed to create better human beings. Um, that's like Karanz is really upfront with that. So uh, in, in that sense, it's a little bit more like an Eastern martial art where it has a a vision towards self-improvement that we don't see explicitly stated in some of the other things. Um, I think, um, like Tim said, the notation of the system is really useful. And Destreza, like saying what's better, modern fencing or Destreza, well, you can't, some, some parts that are difficult to tease apart because um, Destreza helped build classical and modern fencing as we understand it. So Carranza is bringing theory from the way that you argue in rhetoric, putting it into a sword fighting context, and then other people pick that up and it rolls in to these other systems. So they're they're borrowing. Um, uh, there was one other thing I was thinking. Mechanically, there are a few parts about Destreza that I find really useful, it's, um, especially when it comes to looking at fencing time. So. Um, learning how to fence in appropriate disposition was really useful, and uh, we got we've got somebody who's not muted. We're getting some noise. I think that's Denise. Got it. Got it. There we go. Um, so uh, in Destreza, the idea is not to counter, not to work against somebody's technique. Um, rather to work against their movement, respond to motion rather than um, some name technique which you're trying to predict what the adversary is doing. That's a really useful way of fencing. And um, uh, fencing from upright posture, that's different. Uh, and then we've got this idea of um, when you take the Atahu on the outside, you profile the body, and when you take the Atahu on the inside, you square. Uh, and both of these are strengthening positions. Uh, that's something I still need to work on. So the more I spend, the more time I spend in the tradition learning how to do it, uh, the more I find that's different and interesting. I think there's just tons of stuff out there that we're still looking for. So, um, uh, Mendelovitz asked, uh, what does it mean to respond to movement? Want to talk about that just a little bit, but. Yeah, so um, I talked about Pacheco's ability to notate fencing actions, and he will decompose. Um, so let's take um, a from engagement of fourth, disengagement of third and glide. Right? That's a classical Italian way of describing something. And in order to unpack that, you need all the jargon, and you need to understand it well. Uh, see the fencing. And what Pacheco would do is he would decompose that action. He'd pull away the nouns and give you a list of movements, right? So when I'm engaged on the inside line with my blade, similar to the Tahoe on the inside, that's engagement of fourth. And I'm going to release that weapon. So that means I'm bringing my blade in line. And then I'm going to go ahead and bring it away. And I'm going down. And then I'm crossing that center line again. I'm picking up. And I'm engaging the blade and I'm pushing through to make that glide, right? It's just let go of the blade, make a circle under it, and push. But by decomposing it into simple movements, Pacheco can apply a really short like flow chart to this, which is really elegant. And it, it boils down to, is the weapon coming toward me in such a way that it will wound me? If it is, I need to put my sword on top of it and, and create an Atajo or some kind of defense of steel. And if it isn't, then I'm going to put my point on the adversary and uh, either strike them or threaten them uh, such that I disrupt their action. And uh, so 
he doesn't care that you're trying to do a disengagement to glide in third. He cares that you're, you've moved off center line and you're not actively striking. He's not going to try to read your mind about it. Does that answer the question? Maybe. I think there's a there's an odd uh, kind of paradox in distress, right? Where when I think of responding to to technique, we sort of assume that we're properly identifying the technique and the behind it. I so the intention could be actually a full attack, or it could be probing action of some sort. But we're doing a certain amount of guesswork as to what's actually going on. And we specifically don't want to do that in Distraza, right? We want to work against things that we can absolutely observe and, and know, right? So breaking things down into movements lets us do that. At the same time, we must be able to do all these things because we understand what's possible. And so we very likely do understand the technique that's happening. And, and may think that we're interrupting, but we don't want to. We don't want to interrupt the technique. We want to interrupt the movement, right? Part of the technique, break it down. Does that make sense? It makes sense to me, but I've known you too long. All right, let's uh, let's pick up some more questions here. Um, we know that in a fight, we shouldn't live in right angle guard. If we avoid it most of the time, are we fencing the true school? And how much right angle is too little and how much is too much? Well, if you get hit, it's either too much or too little. I was just thinking about this. Tim, before I jump into this, do you have uh, thoughts on this one? Uh, I do. I do have some very specific thoughts, but maybe uh, maybe I'll let somebody else go first. I, okay, so I, I was thinking about um, um, what is it that makes technique right? And one of the problems with the Streza, the classical fencing, um, like I, Eric and I are both examined classical fencers, and um, there is a peri of fourth, and in that peri of fourth, both Eric and I were expected to have it at a certain height, a certain hand position. The relationship between the strong of the blade and the weak of the blade had to be at a specific angle. So there was a right answer to that. And Destreza is not about giving you right answers. Destreza is about giving you the tools that you need to understand like these causes and how to read the causes so that you can create good fencing. It's not a place where like a fencing master is going to show up and give you the right answer. I, sometimes I wish it was. Instead, we have this responsibility to practice this this um, applied classicism, um, and like the medio concept is really key to that. Like between extremes, there is a choice that you're going to make, mindfully choosing the right answer as best you can, and um, if you choose well you create beauty, right? It's this virtue in the world. And that's that union like from science and practice, you're empowered to make this choice. And that choice, if it's beautiful, you're, you have created art, you have shown the art. If you choose badly, like I do, um, you're probably gonna get pezzed in the face. Um, so what does that tell us about right angle? Well, I'd love to give you a good straight answer about that, but um, really what it is, is about evaluating the situation as best you can and, and trying to find a medio for that answer. It's, it's the best Weasley answer ever. I'm never going to answer it. Depends on the context. All right, that's right, pass me, Tim. No, go ahead, Eric. So I've been thinking about it also. Because we, we started off at our school using right angle a lot 
I've been slowly going away from it. Uh, but one of the ways that I thought I thought Figueroa said this, but that the secret of our art or the summation of our art is to fewer and smaller movements than our opponent. And so if you start and and you can successfully work from right angle, like all of it's are going to be smaller. It's great. But as soon as that's not successful, whether because they take your sword or because they're moving around in some other ways, or you have to move further or you're off balance or whatever it is, then you have to go to something else. So um, the context and to some degree, your opponent, not just, uh, you know, should we use it more or less? Use it if it's useful. Yeah, so I think I think a right angle is way overblown. <laughs> um, I think that, from what I recall, like Figueroa, he only like profiles and uses right angle when he's stabbing somebody, essentially. Um, maybe when he's when he's cutting, um, but that's that's the idea. I think I think it's a, a useful reference point for the authors. Uh, you know, they, they establish that principle of the right angle right away. You know, show that it reaches further, which it does as long as the other guy's standing like you are, um, and then that gets used as uh, the reference point for everything else. So. If, uh, like, you read Pacheco talking about the vulgar authors, he starts to pull sensors out in right angle, and then he describes the movement. And that's kind of silly. I mean, I don't, I don't know why if right angle was this huge revelation and, and uh, it should be used, and it's true to say the wisest vulgar guy starting out in right angle. Uh, so from a personal point of view, I, I don't like to be in right angle if uh, I don't have to be because I don't like people messing with my sword. So when I put my arm out in right angle, then it's like saying, here, why don't you do something to this sword? And I, when I present right angle, I want to be uh, saying, here, why don't you not get stabbed? You know, rather than just kind of walk at them with right angle and allow them to do something to my blade. So I think it shows up a lot in the treatises just because it's a, it's a useful reference point. But I don't think necessarily that the uh, amount of time that it shows up in the books is proportional to the amount of time that it should show up when you're fencing. That's good, Tim. And I think you really like summarized uh, some of the counter arguments. So like Alberto uh, Bonfresi, for example, not a big fan of fencing in the right angle, um, tends to find it situationally. Um, and there's there's a another argument that can be had there, which we should touch on just briefly. It's like, what if we haven't spent the requisite time in that position to find it practically? So, like for example, Caden gave a presentation about how a Tahoe is trash and you should work the right angle. If you haven't listened to that, I think it's really fascinating because he's spent a lot of practical time finding right angle, um, and it's it's part of that community pressure testing. So maybe maybe Caden has found something um, that uh, will be the way. We don't know, um, but I think I think we still have a discussion to be to have about right angle and how to use it. Um, but right now, uh, it's got some drawbacks. It's got some blessings. Anything else to add on right angle, guys? Lois? Well, I'd say from uh, I would say, let me say this. So, uh, the, whether we start profile or not, and I, I when I talk about right angle, like I'm really talking about the of the sword, not the rest of the body, right? So I, like, I, I'm never profiled. I'm close to hitting, and I'm not even always profiled very well then. Um, but I don't hard in right angle very much because I, my time background, I don't care if the opponent, my sword, like, then I know exactly where they are, what they're doing. It's, it's great. Uh, uh, as long as they're not, like, super young. 11 foot lunch, but then it's not so good. But uh, yeah, for the most part, um, like it's another way to read where your opponent is and what they're doing. 
In fact, I think um, I think Figueredo says that the the main need for Destreza is is uh, sight and followed sleep by touch. All right, I'm going to pull some more questions here off my list. Um, how do people feel about the divide between academic Destreza and the fighting art? How much do we how much do we feel that divide really exists? And is it useful to have something like these causes that we talked about memorized uh, when life is on the line? I think that memorization isn't the right uh, terminology to use here, right? It's like, like just just memorizing technique or memorizing terminology. It's not like internalizing it is. So yeah, if, then, I really like that. if you can internalize the, those. Uh, Specific Aristotelian terms for causes, then you in real time. Right? It's it's just a language, right? I haven't internalized them, so I don't use them. But a lot of it, um, you know, just generic cause. I don't mean generic. I mean like all the causes lumped together um, and assessed through my ex thinking about. Um, the specific types of distance that we, yeah, these are all great. Right? I, I feel like we're, this is the closest that I've felt in any of the martial arts that I've done where I feel like I can fence from philosophy or fence from theory. He's out of practice doing it, right? But you can think at that level. Yeah, I was going to say something and then I started listening to you and I forgot. What was the question again? So I'll jump in. Yeah. Um, so to me, I think it, it depends uh, greatly on the on the individual. So uh, I know when people start talking about uh, Aristotelian philosophy and causes and stuff, my eyes just glaze over and I go, I don't care about any of this garbage. You know, it's to me, I, this is like an add-on. It's something that uh, the authors were using to legitimize their their art rather than something that was more of a, a tool. That doesn't mean that it was that way for everybody. You know, some people, I like I hear people talk about it and they get really excited about it. You know, and and, and it helps them to understand things. But to me, it's uh, it's just um, it's just dead weight. You know, it's just. Time talking about things that I don't really need to, to concern myself with. Not that I don't need to concern myself with uh, circumstances, because uh, some people just need or it helps them to have uh, these kind of formalized causes to think about the hows and the whys uh, in order to get it. And other people get it a little bit um, more readily, I think, and don't necessarily need it. So, you know, like, oh, we got to talk about the material cause because the sensor is taller and therefore blah blah it's like yeah i know he's got more reach let's move on you know it's it's something that uh it seems to me and there's there's quite a few other things that are similar to this that show up in the books that just seem to be added in in order to uh add some legitimacy to their their work and trying to like raise it up to the level of a, of a science rather than just you know a lowly mechanical art where people are are um, actually working you know with their bodies uh and so i think that's probably just my personal opinion from having to trudge through all of these sources and, and look at you know somebody quoting some you know some greek on what exactly a circle is and this guy has this definition of a circle but this other old greek guy has a slightly different definition of a circle and it's like well who gives a damn just let's move on okay let's 
If you don't know what a circle <laughs> is, go read geometry or whatever and just, just move on. Just, just, just don't care about it. So, uh, to me, I'm very much not on the um, academic side of fencing. Like to to a certain extent, understanding the theories behind it are important. But when it gets to the uh, kind of window dressing of Aristotelian causes and things, I just I just shake my head and get through it as fast as I can. So to some degree, I'm I'm definitely with Tim on that philosophy, not fencing from philosophy texts. Right, I, I I glaze over when I read some of that stuff too, but. Like, there's a lot of it that can be translated into something that's that's you know known to us. I mean, the whole Goldilocks thing, right? Finding the medio. I mean, that's that's great, right? You, some older texts on pretty much any topic, and they're like, pay attention to this list of things. Neither too much nor too little of either of them or of any of. Them. It doesn't matter if it's cooking or whether it's. Uh, you know, setting fence posts, distance, or whatever it is, right? Um, so there's things like that 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 translate into something that is easy for us to look at, and we have an assessment to make. But it's based rather than the specific tip. I think there's something to what Tim is saying as well. Um, that Carranza was trying to elevate the art. So pre Carranza. Like a lot of the fencing masters were illiterate. They didn't sign their names with X's. And he's got to try to sell this this tradition that he's creating to uh, an aristocracy, an educated aristocracy. Um, but that being said, I think he was also like legitimately uh, interested in unifying science and practice. He tells us uh, in the book that uh, if the distress is like a house, science is the door through which you enter. And um, like personal anecdote, I learned a fence in the SCA, and it's a really ad hoc training style, right? You go, you have some fights, and you get hit a lot, and then the next time you go again, maybe you get hit a little less. But um, finding like a coherent fencing theory in that situation is um, sort of catch as catch can. But when I started teaching, and I started teaching a coherent system of fencing, um, it took me 10 years to get good enough to win in a tournament. With that ad hoc sort of SEA thing. When I teach fencers now, they cross that 10 year gap in record time because um, we know what good fencing is. So there's definitely something to um, using this, like that idea that science is the door to the art. I'm totally down with that. And I think Carranza, like, yeah, he is trying to elevate the art, but I think he, he legitimately believes it. And I think there are good reasons to believe it. I don't think we have to worry. Like when we get out to the really academic parts of the philosophy, that's more like angels on the head of a pin. And then there are really practical parts of the theory that I think we're all going to use um, just naturally. Lois, you should chime in on this one too. I mean, it, it's obvious I, I, I love the crunchy academic stuff. Part of it's, I guess, because, you know, love of archaeology, anthropology, it's the story of people. So um, I find that when things get really crunchy and I just sort of want to shut the book and walk away because I'm sick and tired of the convoluted language, refusal to use punctuation. I take a little bit of time. <laughs> I can see Tim laughing. He, he knows the struggle. Um, you come and then like you learn some really neat things from just throwaway stuff like in 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 um in pacheco's pro i just finished translating there's a whole bit where he's like totally rah 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 carranza and then he'll just flip the script and he says now listen not to brag, but i'm the only person who can actually understand what carranza is saying and bring it to you the public um my American sensibilities are like, oh my God, you are a Gamergate troll. What the heck is this? But he's not. He's coming out of his own time and space. He's coming out of his own milieu, if we're going to use academic terms. Um, and then that helps me when I understand what's going on in the book. If I have a reasonable understanding of that milieu, then that, that helps me connect with the art as much as the science. 
So like, I really enjoy, you know, when I'm fencing, I'm not thinking about causes. Like there's no active conscious uh, operation of, ah, opponent, Chris Lee is much taller than me and is using a dagger. No, it's, uh, this is a friend of mine that I fence a lot. He's really tall. He likes to spring out a lot and he's using a dagger this time. Um, so like uh, I talk about my sense of distance isn't a, you know, it's not like I'm eyeballing. It's I'll get a spidey sense in the pit of my stomach. So if I'm fencing someone and my distance starts to get compromised, it's not an, oh, I'm getting too close. No, I get this fuzzy feeling in my gut going, you, you, need, you need to move. This is not where you should be. And so for me, uh, the academic and the practical and the science and the all live in the tangled knot of miscegenated roots that are who I am, you know? I'm Mexican-American, or, you know, a writer who does technical stuff and a technician who does artic artistic stuff. I'm somebody who looks at very academic texts and I do my very best to make it accessible to as many people as possible. For me, this is my happy place, the connection between practical, academic, scientific, and, and artistic. Like this is, this is, this is my favorite pool to splash in. Um, I, I, that's the answer you were looking for, but that's the one that came out. <laughs> no, it's, I like it. Um, we got, we, we have some more questions. This, I'm going to like cut this one to the head of the line because it's so juicy and I don't see a whole lot of people drinking yet. So this is an opportunity to, to get the um, Sacramento Sword School lecture series drinking game in the high gear. Um, who do we think stole more ideas, Luis Pacheco de Narvaez or Thomas Alva Edison? I'm just going to go out and say, I think Pacheco stole them all, right? I Okay, so like, did he invent the notation system? I think you can make an argument for that, right? I'm reading the chat here. All right, somebody else jump in on this one. Tim, you're muted. I can see you talking. No, I was I was just laughing. Uh, I I don't think I need to say much on this. Like I I hate Pacheco. It's known that I hate Pacheco. So uh, you all can imagine what I would say. The funny bit about that for me is that sometimes when I get my Pacheco just a little bit wrong, you know who jumps on me like a Pacheco bishop. It's Tim. Like he's the one. I, he's I the, do. You're the Pacheco influencer. Yeah. And that's because I mean he's so he's so dogmatic and he's so much. This is the way, and thou shalt not deviate. That I I I, um, I have a certain amount of, of uh, joy that uh, what's that German word Schadenfreude, where uh, you know you get to see people who supposedly follow these rules and then they break these rules and then you get to point at them and go, ha ha, you're not following the rules, you know? And so uh, I like to do that with people who like Pacheco and who don't follow Pacheco's rules. I go, well, you know, Pacheco said you should do this, so why aren't you doing that? Especially because most of the time people who follow Pacheco are very, uh, are sticklers about certain things and there's, there's no wiggle room because Pacheco said so. And so when they do that, I like to just throw it right back at them. You know, it's like uh, people who are, are very, uh, like to quote things in, in Old Testament Bible or whatever. I'm like, well, aren't you, aren't you wearing blended fabrics, you know, or eating shellfish or whatever? It's, it's that kind of thing. Pacheco has this really lovely turn of phrase that he uses. Like he describes certain sets of actions. Right? He says, there's this, there's this, there's this, and there are no others. Right? That's always it. He always like ends with that. I have I have completed the set. No other human being could possibly come up with more attacks than what I have just described. He's wonderful that way. Lois had a good comment, which I think is really insightful. I, I could just read it out loud, but I'd rather hear you say it. Which one, the Edison one? Yes, just so. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Who, who stole more? Well, Edison st stole more broadly, but Pacheco stole more deeply. Yeah, you got you to gotta delve a little bit. Okay, so the idea here is that Edison, Edison uh, sort of, you know, he watched what all these researchers were doing. 
watched what Tesla was doing uh, and would pick and choose what he felt was more profitable. Like he, he was just trying to gather things. Um, but what Pacheco wanted to do was own the Stresa. So, you know, who cares what the Vulgars are doing? Who cares what military tactics are doing? He wanted to own um, uh, the you know, he was he was laser guided onto uh, political power based his um, irrefutable knowledge and control of verdadera destreza as it related to the state. And if he didn't steal, he refuted. And even if he refuted, then he would steal. It was all about making him look correct and making everybody wrong. Man, from a joke question, we got a really good answer. Thanks, Lois. <laughs> I really like that. Um, okay, that was that was pretty good. Eric, did you want to jump in on that one, or do you feel okay with what's already been said? You're muted. I have nothing to add. Yeah, I think Lois like just dunked on all of us there. Yep, mic drop. Um, okay, uh, I think this was this this question is important. Um, do does our panel have any advice for someone trying to practice alone uh, during the quarantine, especially for someone who's really new? Uh, new to fencing or just new to distraza? Oh, I see typing. Uh, yes, the answer is yes. Yes. No, I guess I feel like in the absence of someone to actually work with, I wouldn't try to work too much from really your, your love. I think there's a lot of videos out there demonstrating things. I suggest go look those up. Uh, try mimicking what they're doing. Look up. Uh, you feel like you have some sense of fencing, then uh, look up good fencers like uh, Tom Pui and try try moving the way he does. And you can you can actually imagine what he's facing and doing his counter what the, his opponent is doing. But, I think I want to jump in on this one too. So uh, let's say that you're new to fencing and you're new to the tradition of the Spanish true school. Um, so what, what can you do in the pandemic to get yourself ready for that time when we're all back together and we have our fellowship and we can pick up swords and play? Um, the first thing that I think you could do is you could get access to a text like page to practice is in English, um, but a lot of that stuff is also up on my blog. And I think there are 14, maybe 15 actions that you need to know and understand um, as far as technique to know, to be able to practice the tradition. You need to know your simple attacks. Uh, and the, like we quiz all my guys. So all my guys are like, all the people from my school are like chirping up, like what are the simple attacks? It's the thrust, half cut, half reverse, full cut, full reverse, your simple attacks. Then you need to know your defenses. Those are right angle, the Tahoe movement of conclusion. You need to know what each one of those are, how they work, maybe variations on those so that you get used to the ideas. And then you need to know your generals. And the generals are uh, narrowing, weak over strong, weak under strong, and line across. Uh, because nobody else ever wrote any other generals, and if they did, that was wrong. <laughs> like, like, I don't know, maybe his name starts with a V and ends with a Yedma. Um, and then probably what you also want to know uh, you need to know uh, how to increase your strength in the bind. That's movement of increase or uh, graduation. And uh, how to decrease your strength in the bind. Uh, that's movement of decrease. Um, what are those? How would you use them tactically? And then probably one more I would add to that is um, the movement of diversion. And that is when the adversary's blade is covering yours or is about to cover it with an atajo. Uh, you lift your hilt to close the line of the sword. Now, what does that really mean? Because this is not something we've really talked about much. Um, it looks like classical Italian saber hanging parries. 
uh, when the adversary takes your weapon, you lift your sword arm with the blade turned out so that you can cover your cheek. And if they take it on the outside, you lift and you're kind of looking under your weapon, perhaps, like this. Um, those are movements of diversion. So um, let's say that you want to get started. Practice those and learn the jargon and uh, get some idea of how those fit together so that when the day happens where you can pick up that sword and go find a friend, um, you're ready to, to give those a try. All right, now I need to pass to somebody else. So uh, I, I've got I've got a suggestion. Like both of you have been very technical, which is awesome. Um, but technical can be really difficult to starting out because you're looking at this wall of letters, you know. And if you don't speak Spanish, it's it's that much worse. Come join the the the, uh, the Stresa Discord. Come and chat with us. Um, that's where you can ask all these great questions about. Uh, the basics of uh, we can point you to uh, we can point you to videos. I mean, uh, it's a little difficult for me just because of my current living circumstances, but I'm pretty sure if you, if you ask nicely enough, you could get in touch with somebody on that Discord server and you could say, "Listen, can I do some video of me doing stuff and you can help correct?" Me? And I'd bet you somebody would help you out. Um, we have like the. One of the most powerful things we have is this community. Get in there and talk. Ask questions. Don't be afraid to look silly. Like, I could not understand. Um, I couldn't get my head around the timings, around the considerations, propia, propia de transferido, until I hung out with Puck and Eric at VIS. <laughs> I'm like, see these words. I know vaguely what they mean, but I just can't, I, I cannot apply them. I can't embody them. And to me, these are fundamental things, and I've been doing this for how many years? So don't be afraid of what you feel like you do or don't know, because we're all full of Swiss cheese here. This is not a living tradition. We're rebuilding it as we go. And the best way to do that is to keep talking and asking questions and making jokes and, you know, memes. All that stuff helps. Just come hang out, talk. Yeah, so I have another anecdote because I really like the way that you said that, Lois. Um, somebody um, told me a long time ago that translating the tradition was unethical and that unless you could read it in the original Spanish, you shouldn't be teaching it. And um, I found that particular uh, thing pretty offensive. And so I just come back with that and I said, um, you know, one of my greatest strengths is that I'm not going to let my own ignorance stop me. Um, I am just going to go, right? When it was, I'm not going to name the name, but it wasn't William Wilson. Um, and William Wilson has always been a sweetie to me. Um, so, like, the way that I learned how to ski was somebody told me, says they put me on skis on a mountain and said, okay, the first thing you do is lean forward. <laughs> and so I leaned forward. And then it was hippie falling down a mountain. And I just kept falling down the mountain and falling down the mountain until, like, I sort of figured it out. Um, but if we wait until we feel like we're confident or prepared, um, we're not going to make it. We'll, we'll never start. So we just have to, to accept that we're not going to be perfect um, and just gradually reduce our own ignorance and lean into the community to help us like sand off the rough bits. All right. Um, Tim, you haven't given us a pitch yet on how to do this from quarantine. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I don't disagree with anything anybody said. So uh, the only little bit that I have to add is that uh, there there is a lot of technical jargon to overcome, and it just, like Lois said, takes time. Uh, you could you could read it all, be super smart, and go, okay, yeah, I get that, and then you go to sleep and wake up the next day and go, oh, wait, what was that again? So it just it's over time. It, you're gonna you're gonna absorb it. Uh, one thing for people who are, are new is to understand that the stress is not monolithic. There's not uh, one particular way to do it. You know, every author has got their own way. And then modern practitioners sometimes will have different uh, interpretations of those authors, or some of them will draw from various authors to create a, a little bit more of a, a heterodox um, approach. 
And so uh, one thing that you can do is then just kind of uh, look around, talk, you know, like I said, join the Discord and get in there and talk to people to try and find what uh, way of distressa that you like. So, uh, you know, maybe you like really like cup hilts and, you know, you, you really like uh, a lot of complicated um, charts and figures, and so then Rada is going to be for you. Uh, maybe you really enjoy philosophy, so then you, you want to, you know, look more in, deeply into that and, and ask more questions about Caranza or things that way. Maybe you uh, like Pacheco's way of this is it and just do it like that. Or maybe you more like uh, Biedma where he just is uh, just kind of a little bit off. So um, Biedma actually, one of the reasons that I, I uh, translated him and one of the things that I uh, that caught my eye was he's got a lot of uh, advice for practicing alone. And uh, the very first thing that he teaches, and, and I kind of uh, agree with this, is he's teaching body mechanics, and he wants you to get your body mechanics correct. Uh, you can't do that. It's hard to do that without a teacher, so he tries to be as descriptive as he can when he does it. But even after that, you need to... Uh, kind of have a focus. You can't just say, I want this as a body mechanics, because when you look at the way people move, you know, it's it's different between practitioners, it's different between systems and styles and things. So um, if you follow Viedma, he's got his drills for it. Uh, other people have some uh, introductory materials. You know, you can see videos like people talked about uh, in order to figure out how to move your body. And uh, you can you can do that as you're mostly working footwork, you know, just, just working on particular footwork, holding your body the right way, and drilling that into you, and then put the sword in your hand and do the same kind of thing. But uh, absent that, uh, somebody else mentioned in the chat, you know, just general fitness stuff. Unless you're already fit, you know, you're some kind of an athlete, uh, you know, go lift weights, run, you know, so, something, something like that to get your fitness up, and then it's going to be uh, even easier to uh, to do these things. Cool, thanks. So um, we are uh, well past the hour at this point. I think maybe maybe one more question. I've got a few here. Um, I think we've got a question about tempo, but I think that would send us off on another 20 minutes. Uh, maybe we save that one for another time. Oh, hang on. I, I forgot I wanted to mention something when I was talking about Viedma. Uh, so somebody else mentioned it in the uh, in the chat, but he talks about uh, as you're training alone, he has uh, not really a design, but he talks about a way to uh, have a mount on a wall with uh, something sticking out of it that you can approximate a sword. Uh, so that's something that a lot of people are coming up with now, you know, they're posting ways on on Facebook and things like that, where you have just kind of a stand-in dummy that you can use to, to practice your, your things on. So we had my life, you know, practicing the generals on it and, you know, moving your sword uh, below, like freeing below and practicing your Andalusian thrust and uh, things like that. So that's another possibility because it's kind of boring trying to learn fencing and just moving around without having a partner. So. You know, having something to stab at and a fake sword sitting out at you so that you can whack it around is going to hold your interest a little bit more and make it a lot more fun. I should also say, because um, you're not actually plugging it, um, Tim translated Vietnam, and it's up for free in English. Um, so let's, um, Tim, will you drop a link to that translation in the chat? Um, it's just crazy that somebody does that much work and then just gives it away as a gift to the community. Okay, um, here's a good question for us to sort of end on. Um, I'm going to ask um, Tim and Eric and uh, Lois and Andre to answer this question. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll start with my answer so that you guys can close out. Um, so has uh, being in these talks uh, changed anyone's interpretation of the tradition in some way or perhaps reaffirmed it? And I've been using, like, my skullduggery about all of this is that 
have actually used these to probe like some of the leading people in the community? Like what, how do you see Acometimiento? Because we're still sort of forming our idea around it. And it became sort of a joke, like everyone gets asked that. Well, that's because I wanted to know. Um, I had my ideas about it uh, and I wanted to take a sounding and lean into the community and get that expertise. So yeah, absolutely. The, the series has been good about uh, helping me develop my ideas. And Tim, what about you? Um, yeah, I think because um, I'm not really uh, teaching anybody, I'm not really putting out any material other than translation. It uh, made me kind of formalize some things that were kicking around in the back of my head, which was uh, which was really nice. I had to actually sit down, and, and that caused me to reevaluate some of the things that I thought. Um, but yeah, listening to the to the other speakers uh, made me. There's a lot of them I agreed with, and a lot of them I disagreed with, you know, in various amounts. And so some of it has had me reconsider a lot of the uh, a lot of the beliefs that I had already. So yeah, it's been great. Let's go to Lois. Um, for me, it reaffirmed the idea that Estreso is not a monolith. It wasn't then, and it isn't now. And there is something really magnificent about being in a community where two practitioners do things very, very differently for very different reasons and can happily talk about those differences and have it not become a flame war. Um, you know, there's a lot about um, Alberto Bomprezzi's approach that it doesn't work for me, but I would love to go to him and hang out and, and, and be a guest in his hall and just listen to what he has to say. Um, for me, these talks have deepened my love for the art and the community. It, there's no way it couldn't have. Um, you know, I feel I've got a worldwide family and that's amazing. Um, you know, we're all here, <sighs> very quick digression. And there are two people who put together sword schools. There's the kind of person who's all about me. It's like, I've put together a sword school because I'm awesome and you're gonna love me because I can do cool sword. And then there's the kind of person like Sean, I'm calling him out, who's like, I love this sword stuff. Come here, let me show you how cool it is and come, me. come, come take a look. And that's what this community is. Um, and, and it just like, in, in the middle of so much really unpleasant stuff in the world, this, this is a place I can come to and feel safe. Imagine that I'm with a whole bunch of people who are trying to stab me all the time, but I feel safe. Um, the, the stuff that I've learned listening to how people approach interpretation, how, how different people approach the same text, it's, it's really grounding because it's really easy to get caught up in your own thoughts about a certain way of approaching things. And it's just beautiful to be like, oh, well, my way is interesting, but it's not the only way. And you know what? Matthew Howden's approach to this is really cool and it never would have occurred to me. And I want to play with that some more. So um, I, one, I am the, the Stressa cheerleader, but that's fine. I'm happy to, to be that. But yeah, like it's just, it's been, it's been really grounding and it's been really broadening. I guess I guess that means it's like a blooming flower or something. That's lovely. You know, you called out Matthew Haddon, and I just realized that we have got some of our other people who presented in the chat. So let's let's see. I'm going to toss that question to Matthew Haddon with no warning whatsoever. You're going to have to unmute. Yeah. So I actually. The, it's it's really been great as I've been diving a lot deeper uh, and a lot more aggressively into some of the translation work that uh, in the past uh, pre-pandemic has been a bit more uh, dabblesome. There's, it's really easy, especially with uh, like the Tamaris piece that I'm working on right now, he's writing a compendium so I'm like translating 15 different people just to get one page worth of his stuff out. And so I'm actually 
constantly mentally um, look thinking back to, okay, now wait a minute, we talked about we've we've talked about this person and the the way that they approach these concepts. So what does that tell me about what he probably what what he probably meant to write there because his editing was crap, uh, <laughs> and getting into some of those stuff. The, the concepts that we've talked through on on these lectures have been extremely helpful for for digging into some of that sometimes really murky material. That's lovely. I, I'm going to uh, like pull Alish out of the uh, shadows as well. So can you talk about whether the, the lectures have helped you develop some ideas, whether you agree or disagree with some of what you heard? Does it look like you're muted, but I can't hear you? Maybe you were not expecting. No. It. Yes. Oh, there we go. Oh, there we go. Yeah, I had, had the mic button pressed. So, so it, it's a bit hard since I haven't watched all the lecture yet, since uh, the time is not very good for me. But uh, I, I did watch Alberto's uh, presentation. I already knew his ideas, but. Uh, it made me think about them a bit more, and I still don't agree fully with with this idea that uh, the that the stress in the book is for the for the style for the uh, polite fencing to, to speak on. But I, I think there is something there that uh, interesting is that uh, if you if you fence the stress up. And you have no good protections. You can still practice at a good intensity without killing each other, which I think would be very interesting at the time. And well, this is something that I, I got from this. Okay, it looks like you're talking, but you're muted. Oh, sorry. Uh, so I want to pivot to Andre too, and then it looks like Sean has also popped in. So we'll get him, and then we'll let Eric close this out. Andre, you'll have to unmute. Maybe he took a bio break. All right, let's ask Sean. He has been uh, two kind of things really, which is uh, a lot of confirmation of that I'm on the right track and I'm doing a lot of the right sort of things. I often feel rather isolated in this sort of thing where uh, I can get as much you know, help from the outside as I can think about, but I often have trouble articulating the actual questions that are relevant to the fencing. So this way where it's like being pushed towards me and I go, yep, that's exactly it. That's um, where I've wanted to take that or what I'm like trying to pursue. And uh, backing into that, it's also given me a lot of better ways to express the things that I was thinking and make sure that we're using common terminology that, yeah, the wider the community will be able to understand and is also using. So that's that's been awesome for me. That's great. Work or was I just on you? No, we, I could hear you. That's cool. All right, let's see. Andre, are you back? There we go. I yes, here you. I am. Well, I follow almost all the lectures. Only one or two I skip that uh, I will actually like to to see them. And and I was happy to to find out of Spain like a huge community uh, about the Stretha because since I came to Canada, I felt like real alone. 
And I still I am because in Quebec, uh, there is no one doing the Streta, uh, maybe soon, uh, who, who knows? And I found that the, debate, the debates inside uh, the Streta outside of Spain are healthier than I expected. And, uh, and it's because uh, it's something that I talk in my, in my presentation. Sometimes uh, there are people, fanatics, that they want to bring any philosophy to, to the extreme, to, to the dogma. And, and I found that, uh, that you guys, uh, in general, it's, it's, it's so light, so relaxed. Uh, you just want to have fun and you don't want to do anything else with the stress. I just want to have fun because at the end, life is it's just that, it's to have fun. And I'm so glad to, to have met you all in these uh, presentations. And well, we will keep in contact. We'll keep in touch. That's lovely. Um, all right, let's pass off to Eric to close us out. So I've <clears throat> loved hearing everyone's take on uh, on what they're doing and different authors. Um, I can read Portuguese and some Spanish, so I, I may have more experience with some other authors than some of the people who are here, but others certainly get more than, than I do. But it's so nice to hear from people other than Pacheco, you know, to uh, get their take on it and uh, and what's working for them, and what's not. And uh, so whether I agree with them or disagree with them on a specific thing doesn't really matter. It just helps me to think things through. And the the wonderful moments are when they come up with something that I haven't thought about. I love that. That's fantastic. That's the value of a larger community that can get together and just talk about a given topic. Yeah, it's a really good point. Uh, when we had talked about setting up this series, um, it sort of dawned on us that uh, we had the potential to unify a community through this pandemic. And it, it was just one of those things that was an unlooked for blessing that we could join together like this. Um, I feel really fortunate to have everybody here and have all the expertise and time donated to us. Um, well, that's going to close us out for tonight. Um, next week, we have Kate Hickey uh, from Brisbane School of Iberian Swordsmanship. And uh, we have another speaker, but it looks to me like we need to host some more um, Ask Us Anything sessions. Uh, so I'll, I'll look at when we can fit another one of those in. So everybody be safe and um, uh, we will see you next week.